Nathan, did I hear you say, should I go get him a second ago? I thought I heard that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> we were getting close. We were getting close. I'm glad you checked with him and not Whitney. That's good. All right. If you have your Bibles, open up to Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2. Uh, we're going to be in verses 8 through 14 this morning. Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14. If you don't have your own copy of God's Word, you can open up to page 1179 in the Pew Bible. 1179 in the Pew Bible. As you're opening up there, I do want to remind you that tonight we will have uh, what is sure to be a glorious time of worship. If uh, years past are any indication, and second of all, the sounds I hear on Wednesday nights as I leave, I hear our choir singing, and uh, the sounds I hear, it is sure to be a glorious night of worship, and uh, I hope and pray that you'll make plans to be here tonight, and uh, just remember, we'll have a good crowd, Lord willing, and so, and so if you're a member here at our church, just, just think about our guests when you're here, just if you see somebody that doesn't look like they know where they're going, try to help them find it. Uh, you know, park in such a way that we leave our best parking spaces for our guests. And let's try to be as hospitable as possible here during the Christmas uh, season. Well, if you have your Bibles open there to Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 14, why don't you stand out of reverence for the reading of the words of our God. Luke writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God Himself is speaking to us. Beginning, verse 8. And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom he is pleased. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, our God, we thank you so much for Jesus Christ. We thank you for his gospel. And God, our prayer today is that we would be changed by your word. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We are all, every last one of us, at some level or another, we are all looking for home. We are longing for home. We want to be home. And I think this is especially true. I think we have a, a good reminder of this at Christmas time. For many of us, traveling home or having folks travel home or, or, or being with family via travel or going home is a major part of the Christmas season. It's a big thing. But there's another sense in which even those of us who live near home or at home or those of us who have lived in the same home for decades, there's another sense in which we are all longing for home. And so not just I'll be home for Christmas, but where is home anyway? I think we as Southerners maybe feel this maybe better than anyone else. We kind of understand home and understand a sense of place maybe better than some other cultures. I love the great Flannery O'Connor quote. She says, when in Rome, do as you done in Milledgeville. <laughs> Singer-songwriter uh, Ryan Adams has a song where he, he longs for home. It's called Oh My Sweet Carolina. And he, he's from the Carolinas. And, and, and listen to these lyrics. Up here in the city, it feels like things are closing in, and the sunset's just my light bulb burning out. I miss Kentucky, and I miss my family. All the sweetest winds, they blow across the south. 
O oh, my sweet Carolina, what compels me to go? O oh, my sweet disposition, may you one day carry me home. Everything I've learned and read about Ryan Adams is that he's still out there searching. Another songwriter from Alabama is a guy named Jason Isbell. Listen, listen to his lyrics. He says, a heart on the run keeps a hand on the gun. You can't trust anyone. And the old lovers sing, I thought it'd be me who helped him get home. But home was a dream, one I'd never seen till you came along. In that song, he, he's singing about ultimately finding home in a person, in his wife. However, I think from, from the way we muse about home and the way we muse about where we are and where we live and to the way we pine for it in our lyrics, and this is just a small sampling of, of the ways that we long for home, even in our art, even in our songs, even in our common sorts of poetry, as Paul quoted in Acts 17. As some of your own poets have said, I, I think our song lyrics can often be a mirror back into our own heart. And so we see, I think, in, in so many ways how we have a collective longing for home. And I, I think we long for home because of the one we lost a long, long time ago. You see, our first parents, Adam and Eve, were made to live in God's presence in their home, in a garden. They were God's people, and they'd been put in God's place, and they had perfect friendship with God, and they were cast out of their home because of their sin. They, they brought fall and ruin into the world through their sin, and so they lost their place. They lost, really, ultimately, their family in so many ways. They lost their spiritual lives. All these things were wrecked by the fall. And since then, we waited and we've longed for a deliverer, God, God's anointed one, that son of Eve who would come and crush the head of the serpent according to Genesis 3.15 and restore his kingdom that would once again bring God's people into God's place under God's rule. We, we long for the, the restoration of those relationships that God made us for, our relationship to him, our relationship to creation, our relationships with one another. We've longed for a king, for a deliverer. One who would come and make those things right. One who would bring peace again. One who would restore the shalom of God's creation. We need a Messiah. We need a Christ. We need a Deliverer. So this morning, I, I want to show you three points that I believe will help you see that Jesus is the Christ. I, I hope these points will see you help you see that Jesus is the Christ, and I hope these three points will help you worship God because He is the Christ. I, I hope you'll find it compelling that Jesus is your Messiah. And those of you who don't know Jesus and haven't trusted Jesus, I, I hope you'll see this reality of who Christ is as the Christ, and it'll make you put your hope and your faith and your trust in Him today. So three points this morning. First, Christ brings the kingdom to earth. Christ brings the kingdom to earth. Everyone knew that the Messiah would bring the kingdom to earth. That this was the hope of Israel. That, that the kingdom, and, and, and in the minds of, of, of those who, who met Jesus or knew Jesus or longed for a Messiah, the kingdom that they thought of was the kingdom of David. There, were, there was a longing for this kingdom to be restored. There's something everyone knew would happen. In fact, we see it earlier in this very text of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 30 through 33, when Mary learns that she's pregnant with this child, the angel says to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. And you shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. And listen to what the angel says. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. In other words, what the angel is telling Mary is that he will be Jesus, he will be the Son of God, and he will be the Christ. He will be the Messiah. You see in the text at hand what the angels are told? 
For unto you is born this day, where? In the city of who? In the city of David. David, the king. For unto you is born in the city of David a Savior, a Deliverer, one who saves, who is Christ the Lord. The angel reveals an amazing truth here, though. He, he says he is Christ, and, and so he reveals, though, to these shepherds that he was not merely an earthly king, that he was not here simply to resuscitate the kingdom of God. He, he was here to bring the kingdom of God from heaven to earth. He was the Lord. He, this baby in the manger is God. See, many people misunderstood God's kingdom. The Pharisees misunderstood God's kingdom. The disciples misunderstood God's kingdom. If you go and look at Matthew 16, you see where Peter certainly misunderstood God's kingdom because he testifies that Jesus is the Christ, and then Jesus begins to define for him what his Messiahship would look like, what his messianic mission was, which was to go and to die. And Peter rebukes Jesus and says, this will never happen to you. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Get behind me, Satan. Because Peter is saying to Jesus the very things the devil himself had told Jesus in the wilderness, which is you can have a kingdom without a cross. And Jesus rebukes Peter because he misunderstood the kingdom. This is precisely why oftentimes Jesus would tell his disciples and followers, tell no one that I am the Christ, because he wanted to define what his kingdom would look like. Later on in this very book, Luke, the Pharisees misunderstand. Luke 17, verses 20 and 21, being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed. Nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in the midst of you. What was Jesus saying to the Pharisees? What he wasn't saying is that the kingdom of God is some esoteric experience that you arrive at in a group. He, he wasn't saying that the kingdom of God is something you do. He, he wasn't saying if you look hard enough... And, and you look in the warp and woof of the way things go, you might discover that the kingdom of God is there already. What Jesus was saying is, I am the kingdom. He is the king. And He has brought the kingdom into the world. Lowly and humble there in a manger, the kingdom of God was in our midst. And it is so even now. Because the reigning and ruling Lord Jesus is still at work and still active in the world through His role of the Holy Spirit in His church. You see, brothers and sisters, this is part of what it means for Jesus to be the Christ. It also means He must be the King. It, it means that He has come to reign and to rule. He is the King. And and what this means by way of application for each of us here is this. That means there's nothing. There's not a thing in this cosmos. There's not a thing in your life. There's not a stitch of this universe that does not belong to Jesus of Nazareth. I want that to sit down on you today. That baby in the manger is Christ, the newborn king. There's nothing that Jesus does not reign over. The great Dutch theologian Abraham Kuyper said, there's not one square inch of the universe over which Jesus doesn't yell, mine. It all belongs to Him. And so we have to recognize that we are longing for and living in simultaneously at Christmas time the coming of the kingdom of Christ. In other words, the kingdom has come. The, the advent of the kingdom has begun in the birth, in the life, in the death, in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And yet we still long for the coming of the kingdom, the full inauguration of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. We still long for the day when He will make His enemies His footstool. And so while there's nothing He doesn't reign over, we are also believing that that is the case. And we are also trusting in hope and believing in faith that there's nothing our King won't make right. There's something about Christmas. There's something about Christmas that makes us long for the troubles of the world to be made right. And some might say it's Dickensian sentimentality that makes us uh, want that to be the case, you know, that we've just sort of been sentimentalized into thinking it's important. But I, I think there's something deeper. I think there's something deeper. I think it's because we know our King has been born. And we long for our King to reign finally and fully. He comes to make His blessings known as far as the curse is found. There's not one square inch of that which He has made which Jesus does not and will not reign over. The kingdom has come. Second of all, we need to recognize and consider that Jesus the Christ brings peace to earth. Christ brings peace to earth. Don't you love this imagery? Don't you love this imagery? A few months ago, we were on our way to vacation, on, on our way to vacation, and uh, we were, it was late at night. I've told y'all I like to leave the night before vacation to go on vacation. And so it's late at night, we're driving, kids are asleep, dark outside and we are plumb in the middle of nowhere uh, between Georgia and South Carolina somewhere I, I still don't know exactly where we were somewhere riding down the Savannah River and as we're riding down this backwoods highway I look up and I see lights ahead and I think this is something else this is uh this is uh really weird and finally I talked to Whitney and and said hey isn't this a weird place for a toll booth why is there a toll booth out here? And so sure enough, though, the road just goes straight, and I keep going like a bug drawn to a bug zapper, and it was almost literally true. And, and so we pull up to the guard tower here. It's not a toll booth. It's a guard, it's a guard shack. And they say, sir, I, I, I look out, and I, I see the guy holding the rifle, and, and I, I say to him, sir, I think I've gone the wrong way. <laughs> and, uh, and he says, you know, Sir, I think you have, and uh, I think you have. So there we are. We're at the Savannah River nuclear site, uh, 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 which uh, apparently, from the best I can tell, the United States military has uh, presides over. And and so, and so I found myself uh, away. Uh, not a lot of folks are coming down that road, I suppose, who don't know not to go there. But here I came in the middle of the night and uh, and learned pretty quickly that I'm glad I was not trying to get in there for bad reasons. In other words, just as soon as you look out and you see a soldier, you, you recognize we've got a problem. And it's a problem I don't really have the strength or desire to deal with tonight. And so I got out of there. So imagine how these shepherds feel. An angel of the Lord appears to them. The glory of the Lord shines around them. And what does the Bible say? They were filled with great fear. I believe in reading a real readable Bible translation. I want you to read the one that you can read. Uh, But isn't the King James beautiful? They were sore afraid. Don't you love to hear Linus say that every year in the Charlie Brown Christmas? And they were sore afraid. That's about how I felt pulling up to the worst toll booth in America. I was sore afraid. I need to get out of here. I've made a mistake. You see, we think about chubby babies when we think about angels, which is a mistake. Th- think, think less like chubby angel baby polka band and think more like marine brass, a, a, a marine band. Think more like a military band than you think about chubby babies when you think about these angels showing up. And so the angels suddenly 
is they declare that the Christ has come. And, and they declare to these shepherds to go look and see. Suddenly there was with this angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts doing what? Praising God. In, in the Old Testament, God is called Yahweh Sava'oth. It means God of hosts. And this idea of the God of hosts means the God of armies. These angels are available at His command at any moment to obliterate the earth if God wanted to deploy them to do such. It's exactly what Jesus tells Peter. Don't you think if I were trying to stage a military coup, I could find a better soldier than you, Peter? I could call legions of angels right now to come handle business if I wanted to. All these angels, if God speaks, they show up. If God speaks, they do what He says. If God speaks, they could destroy everything that exists in a moment. And here this great force, this great host, innumerable angels covered in the glory of God, singing forth at night. What are they singing? They're singing about peace. They're singing about peace. They're afraid. They're scared. And they hear the military band of heaven saying glory to God in the highest. And on earth, peace among those with whom He is pleased. They're singing about peace. And don't we need it? What striving there is in our world. What restlessness there is in our world. And when we think about peace, I think that's automatically where we go. We automatically go to, I wish those folks on the TV would quit hollering at each other. Kind of makes me nervous. We go to war. We go to politics. Whatever else we go to. Stop for a moment and think about what striving there is, what restlessness there is, what struggle there is in your very own heart. God, through His Christ, is reintroducing shalom into the world. He is bringing His peace back into the world. God made the world not, not to be difficult. There was work before the fall, but, but the difficulty and the toil of work came later. God made His creation not to struggle to know Him. God walked with them in the, in the cool of the garden. God made us and the nations to be glad and to rejoice in Him, not to be at war with one another. And God made our heart to be restless until it finds, as Augustine said, its rest in Him. You were created to know God. And so through His Christ and through the work of His Christ, through this little baby born in the manger, God is bringing peace into the world, not by a cheap way and not through a simple way and not in a sentimental way, but God is reversing the effects of the fall and reintegrating His creation. God is bringing peace into the world. And how is He doing it? He's doing it at the cross by crushing His own Son under the weight of the effects of the fall itself. He's pouring His wrath out on His Son, bringing peace into the world. And this notion, this idea that those who so easily could be the bearers of God's wrath or the bearers of the message of God's peace, this beautiful thought is bought exclusively by the blood of Jesus. This Christ is the Lord, and He was born to die so that there might be peace. Jesus, the Christ, has brought peace into the world, and we all need peace. Peace. Leads us to our final point this morning. Not only does Christ bring peace, not only does Christ bring the kingdom into the world, but finally, Christ brings home to us. Christ brings home to us all our strivings, all our wanderings, 
all our longings, all our desires? Have you thought about have you thought about the way that those things have brought you such pain, such difficulties in your life? How how a longing for more has left you feeling empty? All of our strivings, all of our wanderings, all of our longings, our desires, they find their yes and amen. Lying in a manger, swaddled, rocked. Love itself being loved. Love itself being loved in a stable on the first Christmas. A little later, Luke traces out Jesus' genealogy. You'll notice that here in the Gospel accounts, the genealogies end. Because I, I, I believe the genealogies of the Bible are meant to trace the line, to trace out, to keep a record of the Messiah. Knowing that one day God had made a promise that there would be a Messiah who is descended either from Eve, and we see and we see genealogies throughout Genesis. In fact, Genesis is centered around ten genealogies, and these are the generations of in the book of Genesis, or a descendant of David, and so we see genealogies along David's line. We see these traces of the bloodlines, and yet the last genealogies are in the Gospels because that's when the Messiah came. And Luke traces out Jesus' genealogy. And we're in verses 37 and 38 of chapter 3. I, I'm not going to read the whole one, but, but listen to this. The son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahaliel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enos, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of God. Luke is going to great lengths to demonstrate that Jesus came not only from David, but he came from Adam. That, that he is the second Adam. He's drawing this parallel intentionally. That the Christ is not just the Christ of Israel, but he is the Christ of the whole world. Descended not only from David, but descended from Adam. And that in the person of Christ, in the second Adam, in the new man who's come from heaven to restore all things, God is bringing home to us. God is helping us go back to Eden through Christ. And not only is He not, help, not simply helping us go back to Eden, He's bringing the garden to us. He's bringing the kingdom to us. Did Christ not teach us to love our enemy? Did He not build His church to bear one another's burdens? To love one another? Did Isaiah by the Spirit not look out into the future and see a world where we would beat our swords into plowshares? Where we would love perfectly and love one another perfectly? Is Christ not healing that relationship, that gift of relationship that God gave us between one another, the relationship between man and man and man and woman? Is, is God not making that relationship whole? Is He not restoring unto Himself that crucial part of the kingdom, God's people? And Don't you see how Jesus healed ten lepers? How Jesus walked on the water? How Jesus calmed the storm? How Jesus took water and turned it into wine. He's demonstrating the way. He's making clear the way. That He is Lord over all creation. And that through Him, through His very person, the relationship between us and creation, man and the earth is being healed to the point that we no longer have to fear we, we, we no longer have to fear creation in the way Noah was warned about because of the fall. But instead, Christ is restoring the dominion of man over creation through His very person and work. And those of us, which is all of us, who were born into a far country, far from God, 
dead in our trespasses and sins, longing for home, longing to be made whole, longing to know the one for whom we were made again. Do we not see how our Lord Jesus Christ went Himself to the cross? The perfect man, the very Son of God, and suffered on our behalf so that our relationship with God could be made whole again. Don't you see, can't you see how at Christmas time the Christ brought home to you? You see, the problem with our sin, the thing we learn from Genesis is that ultimately we can't go home again. It's the picture of the angel standing at the gate of Eden with this sword, right? He's protecting this place. We can't go back. Our, our sins have made it so that we, we can't go back home. These relationships are broken and we find ourselves longing for it to be made whole, longing for peace, longing for a good king to rule and to reign over us, longing for home, like the Israelites on the bank of the river, sad, lamenting, singing a dirge, wishing we could go back to Zion. But see, the problem with our sin is that we really can't go home again. But praise be to God. By His grace and through His Christ, He brought home to you. I want to offer an invitation this morning. If you've never put your trust and your faith in Jesus, you can go home. He, he waits with open arms, ready to welcome you into His family today. My hope and my prayer is that you will see Jesus as your Savior, and yes, as your Christ, your King and your Lord. Second of all, you may be looking for a church home. I'd love to talk to you about what it means today to be a member here at First Baptist Church. And finally... Finally, you may be a believer who just needs some time to pray. This altar is open to you this morning. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together. Oh, Lord, our God, we thank you so much for Jesus. We thank you for his gospel. And God, we are so thankful today for this opportunity we have to come before you in worship. And God, my prayer is that we will, each and every one of us, whether we are a wandering Christian or someone who's never trusted you for the first time, my prayer is that we'll be welcomed home today. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.